Hello, and welcome to episode 90 of the Sci-Fi Podcast from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm Nick Zoutra. On today's podcast, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Jonathan Fuller, Assistant Professor in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. John draws on his dual training in philosophy and in medicine to answer some of the fundamental questions in science and healthcare including questions about the nature of contemporary disease, evidence and reasoning in healthcare, and theory and methods in epidemiology and medical science. He believes that philosophy can benefit science as well as healthcare education and practice. John's research currently has two strands, disease and biomedicine, and epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. He studied the metaphysics, classification, and epidemiological modeling of diseases, He's also done research on causal inference, external validity, meta-research, and the relationship between population data and individuals in clinical research and epidemiology. John is currently working on an NIH NLM-funded book project, tentatively titled The New Modern Medicine, that analyzes distinctive problems in scientific medicine around the turn of the 21st century. And thus, without further ado, let's bring in John. Dr. Jonathan Fuller, welcome to the Sci-Fi Podcast. How are you this Wednesday morning? I'm doing very well, Nick. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing well. It's 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 good to see you. I know we're we're nearby one another. Uh, we're calling each other from uh, University of, of, of Pittsburgh. Are you uh, are you home here in Pittsburgh now? Yes, I'm at home, and Pittsburgh feels like home now. It's been a few <laughs> years since I've been here. Just yeah. over three. Uh, um, but I still refer to Toronto, where I grew up, as home when I'm talking to people. So I, I need to, to get adjusted to referring to Pittsburgh as a, at least a second home. Makes sense. Uh, so you grew up, yeah. So growing up in Toronto, and Toronto's, I mean, not too far away from Pittsburgh, is it? You can kind of just hop over. It's a, uh, I mean, it's a relatively short drive. I know we have a, a fellow uh, lecturer from Toronto as well, uh, Austin Dew. That's who's, right. Who's joined us and. Uh, um, well, yeah, well, again, yeah, it's, um, I'm sure it takes some adjusting, but, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll be soon to call Pittsburgh at least a second home. Um, what have you been, uh, what have you been up to this semester so far? Well, this semester I am on a uh, leave from teaching to, uh, finish up a book project and, um, also just get started on some other research projects. So it's a nice kind of time to, focus and catch up on research although i do miss being in the classroom um yeah. i also had last semester off so it's been a it's been a year since i was teaching and uh and uh yeah i, I lose track a bit of what the grad students are doing and um so i am looking forward to getting back to do to doing that sometime in the in the near future Right. So you're currently you're in your third year here uh, as uh, assistant professor in the history and philosophy of science department at Pitt. Um, and so, yeah, you've been teaching uh, up to this point. You've been teaching courses in philosophy of uh, bioethics, philosophy of medicine, things like that. Yes, we have um, a conceptual foundations of medicine certificate uh, in the uh, in the undergraduate program, and that draws hundreds of students. I think over 600 students enrolled right now, mostly from science who want to supplement their, uh, their training, their education in health science or whatever area of science they're yep. doing with some work in the humanities. And yep. it's a, it's a hugely popular program. The courses are always over enrolled and it gives me an opportunity to teach lots and lots of philosophy of medicine and bioethics and not just me, uh, you and, uh, and other lecturers and other and other faculty here uh, as well. So that's um, you know those courses are uh, a huge part of our undergraduate teaching. And at the graduate level, I teach philosophy of medicine, philosophy of psychiatry, history of medicine, other courses in philosophy of science uh, as well. But I think this this undergraduate conceptual foundation certificate is uh, is quite unique, and it's a it's an opportunity to reach undergrads who 
might not otherwise get exposure to philosophy of science and philosophy of medicine. I agree. Uh, yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, having the having the experience this this term to teach some of those courses, uh, the bio, the uh, morality and medicine course in particular. Yeah, the students, the uh, primarily uh, the science, science students in the sciences, uh, pre medical fields. Uh, they t- they love it. They really enjoy the courses. They are uh, many will take it as a requirement, but many will seek it outside of the discipline just because they find it fascinating and it's different from uh, their you know traditional science uh, courses that they have to take in order to in order to graduate. So uh, yeah, no, I think it's a really unique field. And from my from my uh, learning about it, I think it's been around for quite some time, which makes uh, the department very unique in that regard. And I'm not sure exactly how long. At least something like. 15, 20 years or something like that, but it's possible that it's been around for even longer. So um, I think that's a really unique setup that uh, University of Pittsburgh's department has. And uh, it could be an interesting model, I think, to see for other departments, like setting up some connections. I know uh, other, I've known of other departments to do this kind of a thing with um, uh, human, bi- you know, biology and, and other things. But I think uh, Pittsburgh is, for the, for the most part, it's done it the longest and uh, has really gotten the I've just never seen so many students so eager to sign up <laughs> is what I've, is my experience. So, um, well, I, I believe going- it's been, I believe it was started <laughs> in the 1980s by wow. Ken Schaffner. Um, so Ken Schaffner, philosopher of science who, um, at some point, I believe in the 1970s decided to do, uh, his MD at Pitt while he was a professor in the department of history and philosophy of science. And, um, there were of the many initiatives that he started here, um, one 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 of which was the certificate and the two courses in uh, philosophy of science and philosophy of medicine and bioethics that survive today. So it's been going on for quite some time, and it's interesting to think about. You know, the course. If you were, could look back at past syllabi from 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you might get a sense of what's changed in philosophy of medicine and bioethics. What topics have come and gone? Um, you certainly would get a sense of of the different ways that people teach and the different media they use. Of course, you know, Ken used to use overhead transparencies. Now we use PowerPoints. <laughs> uh, uh, 10 years from now, we'll just be lecturing in the metaverse. Uh, right. So, so it, I think, you know, it's interesting that these courses that have been around for a while, if you could look back, use them as a time capsule, you might be able to see, um, you might get a partial, partial lens into how these fields and teaching in general and philosophy of science has changed. Yeah, I could see like a um, a paper out of that, something like a history of pedagogy or something like that that explores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just especially when you have a, it's just not so often that you have like a course or a sequence like this that has stood the test of that it it warrants like historical analysis or or exploration. Um, People like teaching different things. Uh, Courses will change, especially as the departments uh, change. But there's the the consistency, especially with the department is, is really interesting. So yeah, no, that would be interesting to explore. Um, well, I'm eager to hear, learn more about, uh, you, your research, uh, uh also your familiarity with, uh, Ken Chapman yourself having a background in medicine and, and as a philosopher of science. So that's something that doesn't come across too often. So, uh, let's, uh, go ahead and get into it. So, uh, tell us, John, where'd you grow up? Well, we know this. You're from Toronto. Was that right? <laughs> okay. I grew up in Toronto. Yep. And I spent, uh, I spent, uh, more years in Toronto than anywhere else. Um, so when I was uh, going through higher education, I spent four years at Western University in London, Ontario for my undergrad, but then I quickly went back to Toronto for another nine years when I was doing uh, an MD and a PhD. Uh, and except for short uh, stints in London, UK and San Diego, uh, you know, I continued in Toronto for most of my life and then have have been in Pittsburgh for the last uh, just over three years. Great. So, growing up, I mean, was uh, what kind of things were you interested in? Um, was uh, sciencey things? Other other things outside of, of of completely unrelated to philosophy or medicine? Um, yeah. What, what what does someone in, in what I guess what is it like to grow up in Toronto? Well, I grew up in a suburb of Toronto, the West End, uh, named Etobicoke. Um, and so I think it's a bit different than growing up perhaps in downtown Toronto, um, where you, you know, are a stone's throw from the CN tower and, uh, what used to be called the sky dome, the, mm-hmm. where the Toronto blue Jays play. But, um, when I was growing up, you know, I, my first love, my first interest 
I guess you could say academically was, was writing. I loved reading and I liked creative writing. And I sort of thought that I would be a, a writer one day, maybe a novelist. Um, and then my second, my second love was uh, pr- pretty much an, an anything that you could uh, learn in school. So in high school, I kind of loved everything from English to science and philosophy um, and in, even among the sciences, you know, I, I didn't discriminate among physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics. I loved it all. So I was really, uh, you know, bookish, as you would imagine. And, um, you know, still to this day, I, I kind of have a, a wide interest in lots of different topics. And that has perhaps influenced the path that I've taken. You know, I've done a lot, lots of different education and dipped my toes in, in, in different kinds of fields. And that probably reflects partly the fact that my my academic interests are so diverse. So I was in high school taking all these courses. Biology among the sciences was the one I was most interested in. And my, mm-hmm. my father, of course, is a, a, a general practitioner physician. So I was more exposed to medicine than any other career field. For a couple of summers, I uh, worked for him in his office as his receptionist while his full-time receptionist was on summer holiday. And so I got to see what his day-to-day life was like. And I thought this is really interesting. I mean, he spends his days basically talking with people and trying to help them sort out their problems. And, uh, and you know, I could think of a, a heck of a lot worse uh, ways to be spending your, your time during the day. So, uh, and plus my, you know, my interest in science and biology um, combined with, with the, the thought of, you know, being able to spend your day talking with people and helping sort out their problems um, really drew me to, to medicine. So I thought that I, um, I wanted to be a doctor. I put the kind of idea of being a writer uh, on the side. And when I went to, when I, when I applied to, uh, undergraduate programs, I applied to science programs and that's what I did at Western. I, uh, I, I did a degree in medical science focusing on, um, on physiology. And my plan for a while was to go to medical school and become a doctor. Okay, so yeah, so at Western, uh, focusing in physiology. So, um, so that's a, yeah, it's, it's kind of a common story. I know medicine, uh, uh, the the paths of medicine can be certainly influenced by those who you see family members, uh, a parent or a you know grandparent or something like that get involved. Um, and so yeah, so what did uh, what was that like in terms of focusing in in, in terms of medicine? Um, did you have like a specialty you uh, could foresee doing or um, was uh, was that on the radar yet? Well, while I was at while I was at Western, um, I decided to do some uh, research as well during one summer, and also uh, I did an honors thesis that involved research, and um, that research was focused on neuroscience. Um, one project was in uh, reward system uh, that was basic science involving animals and uh, and behavioral models in, in rats as well as um, uh, you know, molecular work and, uh, another project was in neural stem cells. And so, uh, you know, I was really interested in neuroscience above all else in medical science. And, um, so maybe I thought I might become a, a neurologist or something like this. Um, but while I was doing all this scientific research, I also kind of fell in love with aspects of, uh, of research, of science, of doing science itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this continued the pattern of kind of being interested and attracted to everything that I was um, learning about and trying. I also did some philosophy, some history of medicine, loved that. Uh, so the problem, if any, was that I just kind of liked everything that I, I encountered. Um, mm. And and so I decided, you know, this research thing uh, is something that I really like. So why don't I try to, to do both, to train in medicine and practice as a clinician, but also to do science research. And... Um, I was exposed to some people who had gone on to do um, M- to do MD PhD programs. Um, there were a few of these in Canada and many, many in the states. And so I applied to some programs uh, to do an MD PhD, where my intention was to do a PhD in in science and probably in neuroscience. My my letter writer, two of my letter writers were the, the supervisors who supervised my work on the reward system and on neural stem cells. And then the third letter was written by somebody. A historian of medicine at uh, Western uh, named Paul Potter, who um, had supervised a little research project in in history of medicine. And so those were my three letter writers. I applied to Western and to uh, the University of Toronto for uh, to do an MD PhD. 
I ended up accepting an offer from Toronto. And, you know, my intention and what I told the, the, the large panel of 10 people who'd interviewed me for that, um, oh, wow. the Toronto position, uh, was, was I would, I would, you know, be a clinician scientist and my science would be in, my, my scientific research would probably be in, in neuroscience. Um, so, you know, I, when I got into that stage of my life, still focusing on science and still thinking that I was going to be a doctor and maybe now also a scientist. So we're still, uh, still a, quite a, a big leap away from uh, where I, where I ended up. Of course. Okay. Well, yes. I mean, this is a simple, you know, there's, there's definitely the path of the, the, those who are interested in science, but uh, like writing too, I I see a lot of similarities there. Um, So, Mm -hmm. but, but this is, might be the first, um, not the first, I would say, but where you get, so you, uh, you are accepted into a PhD program in neuroscience. Is that right? Well, and here's the kind of, um, here's the twist that made it possible to, for me to do philosophy of science and philosophy of medicine. So when you're accepted into this particular program in Toronto, you don't have to uh, commit to working with a particular supervisor or even a particular uh, PhD program at the university. You're just admitted oh, wow. to this MD PhD stream. Right. And you, you, you typically start off in medical school within this particular program toronto and then you will apply to a phd program often in your first year of medical school and find a supervisor um and so they had admitted me to do an md phd but they hadn't admitted me to do a a phd in neuroscience basic science or even science and uh, anyway my intention was to do neuroscience at the time um but uh then something happened so i was and i can't remember how or why but i was just browsing around um, different web pages, the University of Toronto, and I was exploring the Institute for the History of Philosophy of Science and Technology, uh, Toronto's HBS program. And you know, I, I, I would, I've been interested in philosophy since high school and done a bit in in my undergrad, um, but I had never really, I, I never really was that familiar with HPS as a subdiscipline within philosophy of science. So uh, I, you know, I looked at all the people, the people that were affiliated with the institute, uh, including the affiliated faculty. And uh, one person um, who I landed on was Ross Upshur, who is a clinician at the University of Toronto in public health, bioethics, and in philosophy of medicine. And I never heard of philosophy of medicine before. Of course, I heard of bioethics. People outside of philosophy are, are, are familiar with bioethics, a discipline that investigates ethical issues that arise in healthcare and, and research. Uh, medical students um, do some um, do some work and some, some coursework and training in bioethics. Uh, it's a, it's established. It's a very established and well known discipline. But this idea that there could be something else called philosophy of medicine wasn't something that ever crossed my uh, radar. So I decided to set up a meeting uh, to meet with Ross Upshur and. Um, at this time, he was the director of the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto, and he told me all about um, philosophy of medicine and his and his own path and his interest in this topic. And I remember one one particular. I, I'd read a couple of his papers before going into this meeting, and one of the papers in particular had really capt- captured my interest. And this was a paper where he talked about some of the challenges in evidence based medicine for the care of patients that he often saw in his practice who uh, were older patients with multiple chronic diseases who were on multiple long-term medications, these patients who were complex in their, uh, in their health status and also in their, their uh, patient management, and for whom it didn't, you know, it didn't quite seem like we had the, the, the ideal evidence to guide their care. Um, oftentimes, clinical trials would exclude patients who, who have um, different diseases than the one um, being being uh, studied. Uh, sometimes older patients would be excluded, uh, um, and oftentimes patients on multiple other medications would be excluded. You want to make sure that there aren't any drug interactions that might um, harm patients and also make it difficult to analyze the results. And, um, you, you know, the, there used to be a kind of thinking that um, simpler trial populations would at least allow you to establish the the so-called efficacy of a treatment, how might, how well it might work in, uh, you might say, an ideal circumstances. 
But then what do you do when you are a clinician like uh, like Ross, who, who has a practice population with lots of older patients who are unlike the people that were enrolled in these trials? And so he described the, the problem this way. He said that there are these inferential gaps between evidence or research uh, in medicine and the real world patients that clinicians were caring for. And he, so in other words, he put this in an epistemic way. He described it as a kind of logical or inferential problem. And as somebody who is who, who still was very fascinated in love with science, um, you know, this got this this led me to see that there were these problems in philosophy, science, and medicine that were essentially scientific problems, but also apparently philosophical problems uh, as well. And one person who had done a lot of work in philosophy and thinking about inferences uh, from medical evidence was um, the philosopher of science of many decades, Nancy Cartwright. Um, who who had done some work on causal inference in trials and, and who had published lots of articles arguing that we need to think more carefully about how we actually um, close this so-called inferential gap that Ross had identified between trial population. So this, this, this problem, which has been called the problem of extrapolation, was kind of the first one in philosophy of science and medicine that really got me, um, got me hooked almost immediately. And the idea that I could be doing what was essentially, I thought, science, but also philosophy at right. the same time was really what attracted me to start thinking now about doing a PhD in philosophy of medicine and philosophy of science. So it really wasn't until I was in this program, already, you know, had already signed the papers and was already admitted in, and in medical school that I came across philosophy of medicine and uh, as an area of philosophy of science and decided to try it out. So I started by doing a summer project with Ross. And um, after a few months of doing that, I decided that it was more my style than pipetting uh, in a lab, <laughs> and I I made what, what what was probably a probably an unwarranted um, leap of faith uh, and decided to do a PhD in philosophy of medicine after having not really spent that much time doing um, philosophical research and work and uh, or even or even really doing that much um, philosophy coursework. Um, right. I guess sometimes when you know that you love something. You just take that. You just take that leap. Uh, yeah. You just kind of know that it's right for you, and uh, and it was obviously the best decision that I've uh, that I've ever made. Well, thank you for that story. I think that's. I mean, yeah, it is certainly unique. This is the. Fir- this is definitely. It's. It's. Yeah, this is definitely the first experience that I, um, is, um of in this particular order or this particular. Uh, way um it's you know it it rings true in terms of how many of us find this field of being able to do a little bit of both um meeting mutual interests um a few things i've heard is just i'm really happy to hear that toronto was so supportive of this path um as well as your advisor uh during the time i think that's something that not everyone gets to experience and the thought that um yeah, a program like this would be, uh, uh, yeah, in, encouraging and, and, you know, like this kind of, this kind of area is understanding of that, um, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say eclectic, but just like unique, uh, positioning of sorts is, is really fascinating. I'm sure it was probably interesting to, to meet with other, other people in the MD PhD program. They're like, are you doing what? Like, I'm, what? You're, you're in, yeah. but maybe Toronto was like a thing for that, you know, with Upshore and others. But I imagine, you know, generally speaking, I imagine MD PhDs, right? Or like your MD and then you're in whatever it is, uh, biotech or you're in, um, whatever you know uh infectious diseases like it, it's it's the thought is i'm going to do research in a medical center someday i'm going to do you know there's a little bit of folks who want to, that want to stay in the lab or something like that but so i'm no i'm really happy to that's hear right about this yeah. yeah yeah well i mean toronto's program is you know it's often fairly described as a clinician scientist training program and uh, for most of its history the mb phd program program who wanted to broaden the, the, the scope and the diversity of different kinds of research that were represented. And definitely he, what he had in mind were things like health services research and um, you know other areas of, of health science research beyond basic bench science. I, definitely philosophy of medicine wasn't on his, on his radar. Sure. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I was a little bit of a Trojan horse, right? Because I, I, I was admitted mm. to the program and they thought I was going to do neuroscience. Right, um, and then because because they they admit you to the program and they don't admit you to an area, you're able to kind of 
pivot at that point. And, you know, I think that uh, to their credit, they were very open to the idea of me doing this area that they had never even heard of. Um, but, you know, I do want to, I do, you know, I, I do want to mention that put in the caveat that it's not entirely clear to me that if I'd showed up at this 10 person panel interview and said right. that I wanted to do philosophy <laughs> of science and philosophy of medicine, that they would have admitted me for, for various reasons. One is you might ask, is there really even a, a career path in this, in this field sure. for clinician investigators to do work in philosophy of science and medicine? I mean, we can get to that a bit later, whether the answer is yes or no. But, and the second is, you know, I really hadn't done that much research in philosophy of science um, at that point, any at all, uh, to be honest. So um, I was probably ill-equipped to, uh, make that decision. And, um, and so, you know, as, <laughs> as with many things in life, it's just a kind of confluence of circumstances that allowed me to kind of do this. Um, but yeah, you know, it is a kind of, um, there is a caution there for people who might be thinking, well, why don't I just jump into an MD PhD program and do philosophy right. of medicine and philosophy of science? I mean, different programs have different, they might have different views about these kind of things. In the States, there are programs where it's not uncommon for people to do history of medicine or uh, medical anthropology. Mm, mm -hmm. Uh, So there are definitely places and opportunities where you could do work in humanities. Um, And, um, and I I do know of a couple of people who are doing now uh, or have done um, medicine um, or even have practiced medicine or done residency who later done a PhD in philosophy of science or medicine. Um, So there are examples out there, um, but these, these, Joint training programs, they're obviously not awash with people who are doing philosophy right. for their PhD. I No, yeah, I, I appreciate that caveat. And I think that's something that should be encouraged, that it's especially, especially in exploring the nature of what is what is appropriate or what what is what are the values of that program and what they're what kind of applicant they're looking for. Or and yeah, it's just the the nature of 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 academics as as well as sometimes of once you're in, you can kinda there are ways of of working or, or shifting programs, and this happens in in a PhD space as well. Even if it's not, we're not talking about joint degrees. But no, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I've 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 seen other kinds of programs, things like MD uh, or like uh, MD uh, JDs or something like that, where you yeah. you, st- you might start off at doing you do your core you got to do you just you focus on a core maybe it's i think with that it's like you, you start in medical school then you do l1 and then you you know kind of go back and forth things like that so they figured out ways to do it um but yeah no this is yeah a very unique path so you mentioned something about um and this is very common for folks who come from a, a science background or, or and who you know have philosophical interests but not a lot of formal disciplinary training in in philosophy so it was it in graduate school then when you kind of picked up this second um, you know, or when you decided to uh, find your way into uh, into philosophy in this way, how did you go about gaining some of that uh, disciplinary training? Well, I think I did it in two ways. Um, one is that you know I did all the usual graduate coursework um, in philosophy, mostly from the institute for HBS at Toronto, and uh, and some courses from the philosophy department. Um, so pretty quickly after taking a bunch of graduate seminar courses in philosophy of science, you, you make up for any lack of, um, you know, knowledge of the field, um, and then some, I also surrounded myself with people. I mean, here's the other unique thing about my training. I mean, I, I surrounded myself with philosophers, but also with clinicians. So my advisory committee, my, my supervisor was Ross Upshur, who was both philosopher and a clinician. Um, I yell at Cooper, who is an internist, uh, who's, who does, research in medical education uh, and who has a uh, you know, background in the humanities and, and approaches medical education research from, um, from the methodologies and theories in the humanities. And then uh, I, I, and then I added Paul Thompson, who is a philosopher of science at the Institute. So a, a really even mix of philosophers and clinicians among the group. And I spent my, most of my time, to be honest, uh, not at the Institute, um, not in, uh, not in that building, but rather, in the hospital, Toronto General Hospital, where I had a, a, a desk in the Wilson Center for research oh. in health professions education. So I, I you know, I just I decided that um, you know, philosophers were my people, but also I really liked um, I wanted to stay connected to medicine while yeah. I was doing the PhD. Um, and uh, I, I also envisioned my work as being, um, you know, pretty engaged with medicine and medical research. So I, um, and, and I, I felt like I, fe- I fit in well with that community. So I ended up doing a concurrent 
research fellowship in, in medical education at the Wilson Center. And that's where my, my physical desk was located. So I actually spent more time hanging out with uh, clinicians who were doing research in medical education uh, and, and then, um, then to be honest, philosophy graduate students um, throughout my training. And you know, that, that certainly had an interest in the, the way I approach things, the kinds of questions that I asked, and even my own, the sense of my own identity. I mean, I, I yeah. did and probably still do think of myself as somebody who does medical research. It's just that the tools that I use uh, are tools from philosophy of science. And, um, and hopefully that staying connected to medicine throughout my, my PhD helped keep the relevance of the work I was doing, um, you know, help, helped keep it close enough to medical research in the clinic to be of, of interest and relevance. And so that kind of answers your question. I, I um, yeah. you know, I did kind of get that background in philosophy of science that I needed, um, but also I, I stayed pretty closely connected to, um, and to medicine throughout the PhD. Um, I also spent um, a couple of years abroad, I, I mentioned at the beginning. So I, I uh, went to King's College London in the UK for a year. Oh, um, nice. Because I, I figured, because at the time they had their concepts of health and disease um, program. And King's was sort of perhaps the place for philosophy of medicine at the time in the, um, you know, around the year 2013 to 2014 when I, when I went while I was there at King's, they announced a new program, the Sowerby program in philosophy and medicine, which is growing strong to this day. Um, and, um, and so that was a chance to spend time in an environment where they were, they had a master's program in, um, uh, in philosophy of medicine and lots of people who were doing research in philosophy of medicine. And it got an opportunity to actually spend some time outside of, uh, you know, Canada for the first time. I worked with uh, most closely with David Papineau yep. there, and that was a that was a great experience. Um, spending hours on end fighting about causal inference and randomized trials, yeah, and um, and so that was also really formative for me. Um, and it's often difficult to find the money or the or the, the ability to do these um, um, kind of um, trips abroad during graduate school. But if you can do it, if you can visit somewhere else, um, you know, I, I really highly, highly recommend it. Uh, different people, different environments. Um, it, it, it really, it's really helpful at an early stage to kind of broaden your your perspective and your horizons and give you maybe additional tools um, just just by virtue of working with different people who think a bit differently. Um, so that was really great. And and you know, well, um, then shortly after that, I spent six months in um, at UC San Diego working with uh, with Nancy Cartwright. Um, oh, wow. so it, those, those two experiences combined with, uh, exposure to all these clinicians and philosophers in Toronto, it really had a, a huge impact on my own thinking, um, and inspired my, my own research. Um, and so by, by the time that I had, um, done this six months in, um, San Diego in 2015, I was nearing the end of my dissertation at that point, uh, which was looking at, um, well, well I actually, it was, a, it was a bit unfocused. I, I was looking at both disease and evidence. I wanted to kind of do work that spanned the major areas in philosophy of medicine. Uh, so I was, I was focused on the nature of chronic disease and multifactorial causation on the one hand and evidence-based medicine and, and, the, and these inferences that I initially got attracted to on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and uh, that was sort of a, I, I kind of tried to tie it up, tie a bow around and bring it all together in a dissertation and, uh, and defended that in uh, in 2016 before going back and finishing medical school. Right. Okay. Well, no, I I will uh, thank you for sharing also that um, what I imagine is, is also a pretty unique um, uh, exposure to a, a number of different ideas. I know I've known of you know uh, being a visiting scholar is something that some PhD students do during their time, but it's not always a uh, uh, it, it's not always um, a thing. It's not always encouraged, and I'm I'm really happy to hear that you got to, had the experiences that you did. I think I think it'd be good to see more programs uh, encourage that, so to speak, at least for a semester or or a short period of time for folks, especially to gather some uh, training in the specific area in which they're tr they're looking to work. Um, okay. So well, there's a story there. I mean, I yeah. was fortunate enough to get funding in both, both occasions. And, and the first, when I went to King's College London, I mean, it's very, it's, it's very expensive living in London on a, on, uh, on right. a, a stipend paid for by the Canadian just... dollars. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I was fortunate enough to get a, what they called a fellowship, a one year research abroad fellowship. It was brand new. 
Uh, and it was funded by the Weston Foundation, which is started by the Westons, who are kind of a Canadian institution. Um, they're this billionaire family who owns Loblaw and Shoppers Drug Mart, which are, if you're not in Canada, <laughs> grocery cha- grocery and uh, drug I'll take your chains. word for it. Yeah, I'm sure I'll see it if I visit <laughs> <Yeah>. sometime. <laughs> Um, I, and this was the, and so like when I won this award, um, they had a lunch uh, with, the, um, uh, several members of the, of the Weston family who I suppose played some role in choosing the, um, the winners from the University of Toronto people who were successful. And this is the closest I ever sat to a, a billionaire. So far, I sat next to him at a lunch, Galen Weston senior, who you know, was one of the founders of the company. Um, looking back on it, maybe I should have in like what did that um, feel like? Oh well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, sh- uh, you know, sh- sh- uh, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den style pitched him an idea, um, but uh, some sort but of philosophy. Uh, you got to create this philosophy of medicine institute where you hire yeah. lots of lots of philosophers to do really cutting edge work, and we'll 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 monetize it, and what how we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it was a that, big missed opportunity. No, no I darn. just. Um, <laughs> um, I just kind of uh, ate my um, salad or whatever it was and uh, chatted, <laughs> uh, chatted, uh, get, made small talk. I, I, I don't blame him. Talked about my, my research a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Um, wow. So, okay, well, no, I mean, well, that's the other thing too. It's like getting these, um, getting, it's, it is one thing. It's nice to say, oh yeah, sure. Come, vi-, you know, departments will be like, come visit. You're like, well, yeah, well, kind of, you know, just visiting requires, um, funding and, and requires something. So that's, I'm glad you were able, to, I'm glad this kind of scholarship exists. Um, and I think I, I would hope that this kind of thing, Right. Not just, it wouldn't be, the burden wouldn't be to say place solely on the student to make sense of things or, or the, the postdoc researcher even. That's often when it happens that we can create some sort of uh, schemes to, to, to have this go. So what was it like though to go back then, um, to finish, finishing the PhD and then kind of returning to, I mean, at the same time though, you were mentioned that you're kind of, your people in some ways uh, it's philosophy but as in many ways clinicians you're me- you're doing this kind of philosophy in medicine if i might use those terms um mm-hmm. yeah, so uh, yeah how, what was it like uh, returning back to um to yeah to finish your rotation um you know and uh i basically yeah finish the md well it was disorienting because um <laughs> yeah. you know phd is a phd in philosophy is a world apart from medical school um, you know, the former is, it gives you, especially in the latter years where you're writing your dissertation, there's just wide flexibility, mental and intellectual flexibility, uh, you know, y- y- how you structure your day, totally up to you. Um, y- y- it's up to you whether or not you like get out of bed in the morning, really. There's nothing, <laughs> often there might be nothing you have to yeah. do during that day other than write. Um, right. so, uh, um, you know, I, I, I thrived under that in that kind of kind of environment. By the time I had finished my PhD, I, I'd um, I you know had a publication and maybe even one or two more accepted. Uh, I had presented at conferences and I, I felt like I was kind of a philosopher of medicine now. And I was I had a, a lot of research momentum. I was um, making making strides in the field and meeting people and um, and so I I was I mean to put it one way I, I you know I was someone in philosophy of science and, and, and medicine and I and I and I liked that life uh, and then to go back to the bottom of the totem, totem pole in medical school where you have very little control over what you're, you're doing what you, um, your schedule the kinds of um, tasks you do in a, in a week um, was the polar opposite and, um, and in many ways you know it wasn't uh, I, I didn't love the, the that kind of change of pace uh, I did I was still interested in what I was learning in medical school Right. Um, but I miss being an independent thinker um, and, a, and, and a researcher. Um, now, I, I cheated at first because, um, you know, I went back to year two of medical school in Toronto, which, which like many places, is still a pre-clerkship phase where you're doing mostly book learning with some clinical exposure. And so there is a lot of, there is, there remains a lot of flexibility there. Um, and, you could cram for exams for a few weeks. And then after that, you could take it easy, more or less go to classes, but still have a lot of time to do other things. And so that's what I did. I was, uh, you know, a, um, ultra alternated cramming for exams and then doing more philosophy research, uh, finishing papers and doing revisions on papers. So I was still doing, uh, philosophy research. And so actually the first year when I was back to medical school, I was pretty happy still. 
um, I, I had it both ways, basically. I was doing mm. medicine and I was doing philosophy. But that all changed when I went into the clerkship years where you're rotating around different clinical sites and hospitals. And it's much busier. And you, there, just, there just isn't the time and the flexibility to do very much research at all. I tried to squeeze as much time to do that as I, as I could, but it wasn't very... It wasn't very much. And so and I found myself a few times um, having difficulty falling asleep at night because I was thinking mm. about a, um, a philosophical problem that, um, <laughs> you know, I didn't have time to think about during the day. And so my mind was like, well, you didn't give me any time to think about causation <laughs> today. So uh, now this is my time, baby, uh, from <laughs> 11 p.m. to uh, yes. 3 a.m. This is what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> So, I, you know, it sounds a bit facetious, but I literally did um, sure. you know, yeah, yeah. Lay, in, lay, in, lay in bed at night, uh, vexed by problems of like probability and causation. And then I was showed up to clinic very tired the next day. And that, of course, let me know that um, I was really, really passionate about this philosophy stuff. And I wasn't going to be happy if I wasn't able to do it at the end of the day. Um, and there were areas in medicine that I, that I was really interested in. I, I liked... Um, First of all, I just I liked general practice uh, and the diversity of of things you do and the people you see and the problems you uh, handle. Uh, I, and then beyond that, I particularly liked neurology and uh, psychiatry. Um, and I, I strongly considered going into one of these areas, but I, um, in the end, I decided not to continue after finishing the finishing medical school and do a residency and further training for a couple of reasons. Hmm. Um, the, the first reason, and probably you know, honestly, a very strong factor was that I was burnt out after many years of training. And this is, this is something to kind of keep in mind. I mean, um, you know, in the, in the ideal decision context, you would just dispassionately weigh your, your future options and, and say, you know what, this is, I'm going to spend another five years doing residency training. And then uh, in, in, in a long-termist perspective, this would be the best thing for me. Um, but no, I mean, I was very tired. Um, and, uh, I was. I didn't want to spend any more of these sleepless nights um, thinking about philosophy when I was, and then having to show up to clinic the next day. I really didn't like. It didn't sit well with me not being able to do research uh, during mm. the busiest phases of my training, and that was only going to continue in residency, where you really are more responsible for patients and um, and and just continues to be very very busy. So right. um, that played that definitely played a role. Um, that at the time I didn't want to do more training. Um, the other thing that the more kind of, um, you know, um, intellectual uh, set of reasons for wanting to go into philosophy was that one, um, I made the decision this way. I, I kind of said, well, what can I, what can I not live without? Uh, and I, I come to the conclusion that I couldn't live without doing research in philosophy of science mm. and medicine. Um, and then I probably could live without um, spending time in the clinic. I liked it for sure, but um, my instinct was that I could have a lead a happy life now uh, in philosophy um, and not have too much regret about not doing medicine if it came to that. But I didn't. I wasn't convinced that the other, the opposite was true. That I could. That yeah. if I ended up just being a doctor and and, um, and spending my day in the clinic, that I would be happy. And I think um, had I never taken the the blue pill of philosophy, um, there's another world in which I probably am a very happy clinician, never having been exposed to philosophy of science. Um, I think it's a very rewarding lifestyle, but then getting that blue pill and, uh, and, and, and stepping out of the matrix for a bit kind of showed me that this, this other, this other, um, part of, uh, part of life that now I can't live without. So, um, so I decided that it was that trying to, to balance, uh, clinical medicine and philosophy research was still a very uncertain proposition. Maybe it could be done within bioethics or, or within right. public health or something like this, but, but the idea of being a clinician philosopher still wasn't a very established track. And so um, in you know 2019, when I um, was finishing medical school, um, I was looking at philosophy jobs. And there was this great-looking position at, um, in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, they were looking for somebody um, who might do uh, one of a number of things. And one of the areas they were targeting in their search was uh, philosophy of medicine. And there really aren't that many searches in which philosophy of medicine is a target within philosophy. Uh, So I was very fortunate that this job came up right at the time I was finishing medicine. And um, and I I talked to people about the reputation of the department, and I was familiar a bit with uh, Pitt HBS. And it had this reputation of of being a place in which um, not only were the students and the faculty very engaged with the science 
that they were studying itself. But oftentimes they'd actually come to the department having had a prior background in science, whether engineering or neuroscience or physics. Um, and of course, I knew I know uh, I know Ken Schaffner's work uh, and was aware that he'd done an MD. Um, and so it just seems like, well, you know, maybe these are my people. I mean, um, these people who are obviously very connected to the science that they're studying um, and who are willing to do engaged, integrated work, um, but also are, do, are asking fundamental questions in philosophy of science, which those are the questions that were keeping me up at night. Uh, and so I, I, I rightly, you know, saw that this would be a great opportunity for me. So rather than applying to residencies, I applied to this job at Pitt, and uh, now here I am. Well, wow. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, no, thank you for the update. It's a, uh, I'm, we're, well, I'm, Pitt is very happy to have you, I'm sure. And, uh, no, it's, it's really interesting to think. And I really like your decision making process, um, of how to, of the way, just a very practically pragmatic approach to deciding what, to, uh, how to, to, how to go about, uh, this. And, um, yeah. So, no, uh, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Well, so why don't you tell us, um, a little bit about, so now you've had the opportunity, you've brought us up to speed, but you've decided to, you can finally focus on the things that have been keeping you up at night. So what, perhaps what is one of these projects uh, that you first uh, got into? Maybe like, uh, uh, maybe one of your favorites or perhaps the most uh, in, uh, intriguing to you that, that you were, that the things were keeping you up at night that you ended up working on, that you ended up seeing through to completion. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the biggest project that has occupied me for the last uh, few years has been a book um, that is yes. nearing completion. Uh, well, yeah, why don't we talk about this medicine book. and science? Fantastic. Yeah, so it's Fantastic. a it's um so it's a book in philosophy of science and medicine. Uh, the tentative title is the New Modern Medicine, and it was inspired originally by some experiences back in Toronto while I was doing my training. Um, so on the one hand. You know, I, when I was at Western doing physiology and, um, and medical science, I, I had the impression that medicine was really about the basic uh, medical sciences and kind of using them to inform uh, medical reasoning and decision making. So, you know, the clinicians were kind of like applied physiologists, applied basic scientists. They were they were learning about these basic sciences of medicine and then using that knowledge in order to help reason about disease and treatment. A very naive view about what. Um, medical reasoning was all about. But that was influenced by what were the so-called medical sciences that were on offer for studying in uh, Western's basic medical sciences program. I mean, they did have biostatistics, um, but by and large, a lot of the sciences were uh, laboratory sciences. And these were the sciences that really launched um, scientific uh, medicine into a global institution 100 uh, or more years ago. Um, so the big breakthroughs in uh, medical science and scientific medicine back then were uh, the germ theory of disease, uh, which we st- which is still the theory that, that we, we we accept about how um, infectious diseases are caused, namely by microbes, um, and uh, research in physiology, uh, so called experimental medicine or laboratory medicine, uh, um, about endocrinology and biochemistry. And using that understanding to develop um, um, interventions, and this was kind of the vision of um, of, of medical reasoning and, and medical science that I'd inherited. Um, and a lot of the work, a lot of the older work in history of medicine, uh, which I'd uh, been exposed to during undergrad, and then as I continued to to read and, and do work in during my uh, time in the MD PhD program, was focused on these earlier periods in the history of medicine. Um, and scientific medicine was all about um, the biological life sciences, so-called biomedicine, which is right. still an image of, of scientific medicine that shapes the way we think about it today in medicine and outside of medicine. Um, but, you know, when I when I started to, to do medical school and then when I started especially to do my research in philosophy of medicine, I, I realized that there was a, a whole other side of the picture. Um, there was this movement called evidence-based medicine um, in the second half of the the 1900s, in which it wasn't a biomedical laboratory sciences that were guiding reasoning. It was clinical epidemiology or statistical epidemiological science um, that might often black box uh, details of the underlying mechanism of health and disease and just try to demonstrate empirically what works. Um, And there's a tradition of this in medicine, but it's 
the dominant one in, uh, in clinical reasoning right now. And, uh, you know, uh, now instead of just relying on the laboratory scientists to understand etiology of disease, the causes of disease, we rely largely on epidemiology as well. Uh, we learned that smoking causes lung cancer mostly uh, through epidemiological research. And we learned about the causes of heart disease, the risk factors for heart disease through, uh, you know, famous cohort studies. And this was something that was surprising to me. And, um, and I realized that this was kind of, in a way, the story of modern medicine uh, today. Um, it was a story of epidemiological science shaping medicine. And it wasn't a story that was told to me um, through my science education before that. Um, in particular, there was a, there was a, a book that was published in 2011 um, that I was, that I'd read just as I was starting my graduate training called The Making of Modern Medicine. And this is a fantastic book, a very short mm -hmm. book, under 100 pages, written by the late historian Michael Bliss, um, a Toronto historian who spent the second part of his career as a historian looking at medicine. Um, and in this book, he summarizes a, he summarizes kind of his earlier work and three different projects that he'd wrote, written books about, which were, were uh, smallpox epidemics in Montreal, um, and then a little bit later on, um, the kind of founding of modern American medical education at Johns Hopkins, where they really used a, a, a German model of science education in order to redesign the curriculum, and, uh, and which then kind of expanded outward and, and revolutionized medical education across North America. And then the third episode that Michael Bliss talks about is the discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto. And in this kind of book, The Making of Modern Medicine, he kind of brings these together to kind of tell the story of how medicine became modern in a certain sense. Uh, and this is a popular narrative, a common narrative in, in medicine, but also in history of medicine, that it was, it was science that transformed medicine and made it modern mm. sometime in the, in the 1800s or maybe early 1900s. And the sciences that did this were um, the sciences that gave us insulin, a physiological research. Um, so if modern medicine was defined by those kinds of sciences, then what about what about medicine today? What I came to call the new modern medicine, um, medicine of the turn of the 21st century, evidence-based medicine, and um, the medicine of uh, chronic disease epidemiology. Uh, another aspect to all this was the, the importance of risk and risk factors in medicine, a kind of statistical way of thinking about the aims of diagnosis and treatment. We want to find out not just what diseases you suffer for, from, but the diseases you're at risk of suffering from. And we don't just want to cure you. We want to prevent disease by lowering your risk of future events. So these different elements, risk and um, chronic and non-communicable diseases of multifactorial etiology and the idea of using results from clinical randomized clinical trials to directly inform care, um, these different kind of um, elements, uh, these different um, vertices in a triangle uh, form this picture of the new modern medicine that started developing in my head. And so I wanted to tell the story of what this medicine is and what its unique philosophical problems are. And I thought that I would, I, I needed to, a book to do it. So I set out writing this book, uh, the new modern medicine and it, it investigates these different aspects that I've mentioned, the causation and nature of contemporary chronic and non-communicable diseases, including uh, cancer, uh, as well as the ways we reason from epidemiological evidence and the concept of risk and how it uh, and what it means and uh, how we get from populations to, to individuals um, by talking about risk. So these are the kind of different strands that I try to weave together in the book and give a, a kind of picture of, of scientific medicine today and what makes it different from scientific medicine 100 years ago, the kind of old modern medicine, you might you might say. And so I, if you if you want to call the old modern medicine laboratory medicine or physiological medicine, uh, or experimental medicine. These are all terms that have been used by historians to, to kind of characterize it. So a, a name that I use to characterize this new modern medicine is epidemiological medicine. Um, because while the old modern medicine, laboratory medicine, or experimental medicine, physiological medicine, in terms that historians have used to describe it, uh, was in some sense integrated with laboratory research. This medicine is especially integrated with epidemiological research. Uh, some non-communicable disease epidemiology, the kinds of research that um, that allows you to identify risk factors for diseases like heart disease and cancer, uh, as well as clinical epidemiology, which is the science that, you know, for instance, uses randomized clinical trials to, to figure out what works. 
And um, and although it's, 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 of course, not the case that biomedical research has gone away, in fact, funding has only increased over the decades, uh, and it still plays an important part in medical epistemology and shaping our understanding of disease, uh, you know, I wanted to highlight the unique contribution of epidemiology to thinking about, to, t- to medical thinking today, and to focus on the problems that I, today that are um, somewhat unique compared to problems in scientific medicine of the past. And so that's um, that's what the book is about. Fantastic. Thank you for that uh, that overview. Could you share with us perhaps, so I know you mentioned things like risk um, and other uh, reasoning, multi-factor, uh, uh, you know, multifactorial uh, causation or uh, factors in, in forming, um, uh, yeah, uh, etiology of, of disease or illness. Um, but what are some of the, so for uh, philosophers in medicine, what are some of the key uh, key issues or problems that you, you hope to focus in on the book? Or if you could put them into, uh, into questions, uh, how would you describe them? Uh, sure. So, um, you know, the book, the book is kind of structured with different chapter level questions or problems. And, um, and so I, you know, in, in one chapter, I look at um, theories of disease and ask, are there theories of disease in contemporary medicine? Uh, people are familiar with theories of the past, like uh, humoral theory, uh, Hippocratic theory of the four humors. Um, but are there theories of medicine today or are there just piecemeal explanations? Uh, and I and I answer that actually yes, the history of um, scientific medicine has been greatly shaped by what one might want to call theories of disease. Um, the germ theory was the best example 120 years ago, but um, today we do have a sort of theory of cancer, which some have called the somatic mutation theory. Which um, one one of its primary functions is really to shape or direct medical research into the causes of cancer. Um, and so we might actually be able to talk about theories in this area of science. Oh, um, interesting. And, you know, seemingly an old uh, an old topic in philosophy of of science. So we've, we've gone on to talk more about models and other kinds of and other kinds of explanation in um, in philosophy of science. But this is an area in which it might actually be useful to to think about theories and what role they might still still play in sciences like medicine, which um, at first glance are, are kind of um, motley sciences with lots of different models and explanations. And still there might be these kind of theories that are operating in the background. So that's just one chapter, one question. I also look at um, what it means for diseases to be multifactorial, uh, whether diseases have some diseases have a universal cause, particularly infectious diseases, and whether this is really a fact about the world and about diseases, or whether there's in some sense uh, a way in which uh, we decide what diseases are multifactorial and which ones mm. have a universal etiology. Um, I, I, I develop a, 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 an account of the nature of chronic disease and mental disorder um, using um, the literature on dispositions in, in, in metaphysics to help understand how it can be that people have these disorders that can persist throughout their lives uh, often. Mm. And yet at certain times, they, they, they might not actually be manifesting overt clinical findings. Um, in the case of mental disorders, this is um, you know quite striking because they're diagnosed exclusively on the basis, mo- or for almost all of, the, of those diseases, exclusively on the basis of behaviors and symptoms. And yet it is possible for at least some mental disorders for people to be completely in remission and not have any symptoms at a, get a certain point in time or to, for, to have their symptoms managed uh, effectively by medication or therapy. And so we, we diagnose people as having these disorders using behaviors and symptoms. And yet, for some people, at some points, they might not have any of these behaviors and symptoms, yet they still have the disorder. So what's going on there? And so I try to, uh, to, to provide a metaf- metaphysical picture of how we, uh, I, we still manage to identify the, these diseases over time. Uh, even given periods of uh, relative asymptomaticity and some dispositions is a way to help, help think about that. In short, chronic disease and mental disorders are dispositions towards the clinical manifestations that we actually um, use to identify them, to diagnose them. Um, so that, that's the kind of first big yeah. part of the book as I look at disease. In the second half, I look at evidence, uh, but particularly, um, you know, it, it, um, what is what, what is evidence-based medicine's view of, of evidence? What, is, what does it mean to say that um, a clinical trial is providing evidence for medicine? Um, and, um, you know, what might be the limitations of this view 
in short, I argue that they um, that the view of the, the at least implicit view of evidence in evidence based medicine is that evidence measures clinical outcomes, uh, and so we can talk about the validity of that measurement, whether the measurement is biased, um, its precision, uh, and so on. And um, well, this works. This might, might work. Uh, this might do some of the work we need it to do. I think a broader concept of evidence, which allows for evidence to play different roles beyond just measuring outcomes, actually would suit medicine uh, better. Uh, and so I try to to pull from uh, a theory that Nancy Cartwright has worked on in order to, to um, illustrate that alternative. Um, I look at the problem of extrapolation, that problem that first got me interested in philosophy of medicine, existing work on the on the topic, and what parts of the problem have been somewhat neglected by both philosophers, but also scientists. And that's um, namely the problem of, well, um, you know, once we've determined the kind of inferences we might need in order to extrapolate from studies, um, how possibly could we provide evidence for the assumptions or the premises in those inferences um, where that evidence is strong enough to support the inference but not so strong that upon having that evidence, we already really know the conclusion that we were trying to get to in the first place. So it's a kind of like circularity. How can we be in the Goldilocks zone where we have evidence that can allow us to extrapolate from a study, which will, I argue, and others have argued, necessarily involves some understanding of um, the causes that are at play, at least in those circumstances where we have it sampled randomly from the target population. Um, And yet, you know, causal or mechanistic understanding might also just get us what we want independently of extrapolating. Um, if we know how treatments work, then we know that they work in certain contexts um, in which the kind of relevant factors are present. So that's a kind of log- circular or logical problem that I tackle in that chapter, um, focusing on like what kind of evidence or reasoning would get the job done and not just what assumptions would need to be satisfied. And um, then I turn to risk and uh, what it means to um, to lower risk or to predict risk in medicine, both at the level of populations and also individuals. And I defend a kind of um, Bayesian reinterpretation of, of probabilities in medicine so that we're not talking about an individual patient's risk at all anymore, but we're just mm-hmm. talking about a clinician's uncertainty about whether or not they're going to um, develop an outcome or um, the extent to which an, um, an outcome would um, results in a probability that's lower, or sorry, the, the extent to which one treatment would result in a probability that's lower compared to an alternative treatment or no treatment. And this actually solves the kind of puzzle or riddle about how population data could be relevant to individuals when it really doesn't tell you that much about the unique features of that individual at all. It tells you more about the population in which they're situated, which might be quite heterogeneous. Um, and the answer is just basically um, that these probabilities rather just reflect a clinician or the patient's uncertainty about whether they'll get an outcome, then our uncertainty can be influenced by, um, for instance, the fact that you don't know who in a population, uh, to put it one way, this patient is, whether they're the, the kind of patient that would develop the outcome in the, in the in the population, kind of patient who wouldn't develop the outcome. You can then just rely on the frequency of outcomes in that population in order to, to kind of to base your uncertainty on whether or not this particular member of that population will develop the outcome. Uh, and then, you know, finally, I, I, I turn to a topic that's uh, been popular of late in philosophy of science, which is medical skepticism um, and trying to trying to develop a, a kind of skepticism about medical evidence and interventions that threads the, the fine needle between being overly nihilistic about the effectiveness of medical interventions today on the basis of well-described problems in medical research and being overly or naively optimistic about what uh, therapies can do for us um, to try to so I try to um, achieve this balancing act by uh, relying on a an account of what it is to have meta evidence or higher order evidence in medicine that 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 captures these trends or problems in medical research um, that have been described so the industry funding bias publication bias um, contradictions among studies and other other systematic problems or threats to medical research that have been empirically quantified by scientists and uses that as itself a kind of higher order evidence in order Mm -hmm. to correct or adjust our confidence in medical interventions and to to appropriately calibrate our, our, our skepticism in the evidence, the evidence and the interventions about which that evidence uh, provides some information. So that's, that's the full range of topics explored in the book. Thank you so much for that evidence. 
Excellent. No, this sounds this sounds very exciting. We can hope to see the book um, maybe in the next uh, year or so. I, I, it sounds like um, as, as things get getting on, working on it this year. Okay. Um, I, I know. I, it's it sounds like an excellent work. Um, uh, two quick, quick two quick quick questions. Um, one. So you mentioned um, uh, you know your connection, especially with doing philosophy. In, um, you know, uh, uh, still associated with doing it. Uh, kind of doing medical research in in some way, focusing on topics and and the topics that you discuss are certainly philosophical. Um, and 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 is specifically philosophy philosophy of medicine but uh i interpret them as as much uh potentially relevant to clinicians and others who are reading about these kind of subjects in terms of how to think about um uh not necessarily in in, in directly practical terms but just in 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 the meaning of what they're what they're doing or or medical researchers so how do you see this book is is aligning with or connecting with the clinicians or or medical researchers well the problems are mostly mostly inspired by um, the philosophical problems which I explore in the book are inspired by medical problems, problems that I encountered myself in medicine or problems that are I've read about in the, lit- in the medical literature and that were quite popular topics in the literature for a time. Um, and so rather than starting out in, with a problem in the philosophy of science literature, like, um, uh, you know, uh, what kinds of explanations do we use in science? And is there just one kind of explanation or dominant kind of explanation or are there are there many different kinds of explanation rather it's kind of well how are doctors or science medical scientists actually explaining things um could we use some work in philosophy of science to better understand what they're doing maybe some work on theories in uh and from philosophy of science um or rather should we um you know ad- adjust our our thinking in philosophy of science to reflect um to reflect mm-hmm. the particularities of medicine, maybe the work, maybe that the way that theories operate in medicine or, uh, you know, the way we think about causation in medicine or whatever uh, evidence. In medicine, uh, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's different enough that we kind of have to start somewhat from scratch. Um, and, uh, and so this kind of like medicine first uh, mm-hmm. approach is, is definitely been a thread that's run through my work. Um, there, there are kind of medical problems, um, first, but then they also have a philosophical dimension or element. And so sometimes it could be that work in existing work in philosophy actually helps us to understand them better, work on dispositions, uh, right. or work on, uh, from metaphysics or work on higher order evidence from, uh, from epistemology. Other times it might be a little bit less helpful. Um, and rather we should be, uh, we should be allowing work on medicine to maybe, um, lead us to rethink uh, classic problems in philosophy of science rather than trying to fit problems of medicine to existing paradigms in philosophy of science. Um, so I think they are genuinely philosophical problems, but they just are inspired by, um, you know, by topics or problems in medicine of particular relevance. I mean, it's not like a perennial problem in philosophy, what a chronic disease is or mm-hmm. uh, how we extrapolate from clinical trials. Um it's it's just and it's not even a these aren't even perennial problems in in medicine. I mean, extra, the idea of extrapolating right. from a randomized controlled trial is not something that the ancients talked about, right? Um, <laughs> it's a very um, there are just there are problems of the moment in medicine, uh, problems of the day um, that yeah. um, you know really bear uh, cry out for some philosophical clarification, and those are the problems that really pique my interest. Um, but there are different ways, of course, doing philosophy of science. Um, and yes. it's yep. perfectly fine, I think, to start from a literature in philosophy of science and then uh, and build on that literature. Um, I've always been attracted to the problems in which there isn't as much existing literature. And I think philosophy of medicine, philosophy of medicine really offers that because despite the importance of medicine in society, philosophy of medicine is actually a relatively small subdiscipline in philosophy. Um, and so there are lots of unexplored questions and lots of territory to open up. And I think that's it's an exciting area for for um, you know, junior or senior philosophers to get involved. In. All right. Well, thank you so much. No, that's great. Um, uh, and one more question before we go. So I know I wanted to, I saw, uh, we spoke at the beginning of this, that you have, uh, some time, uh, a little bit separate, from, uh, perhaps, uh, pretty separate from the book that you're doing some work. Now you're planning to head over to the, the NIH. Is that right? Uh, to uh, be a visiting scholar? Is this to, to facilitate uh, or continue your work there? Or, or what will you be up to at the NIH uh, going forward in the spring? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be visiting the NIH 
specifically the Department of Bioethics for uh, a few months uh, in 2023 as a visiting visiting scholar. And um, there are there are a couple motivations for this this visit. Um, one is that you know it's been a few years now since I uh, finished medical school and I've been away from the clinic, um, and um, you know I worry a bit about losing touch with um, with clinical research and clinical medicine. And so I wanted to work in an environment in which uh, people are really, really heavily embedded in medicine. And bioethics is, is a field that's that's just like this. And a department like the, the Department of Bioethics at, at NIH especially. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, just refresh my, um, my perspective a bit um, so that I'm always um, at least partially grounded in what's going on in actual medicine. Um, and I try to do that also by, by, uh, by keeping connected to the school of medicine at Pitt. Um, but this is an opportunity to kind of do that. Um, but also I, uh, one, one aspect of my thinking that, um, it's been a common thread, but I've become, you know, very urgently interested in it as time has gone on is, is how can we as philosophers of science have the, the most positive impact on, uh, science and society? And I'm not saying that this is, the only way to think about the value of philosophy of science, but it's a, it's a it's you know particularly a, a question that interests me as somebody who um, it still thinks of themselves as doing medical research and as as being a kind of like you know retired clinician, even though I, I only mm. did medical school, didn't. But uh, but somebody you know this, this it's very um, a, a great importance for me, and so um, how can we have impact in philosophy of science? Um, and I think there are not, there are some there's some good models for how to think about this in philosophy of science. Now there's this concept of philosophy in science, um, or right. more specifically, uh, philosophy in biology and medicine, a kind of network and movement based out of the University of Bordeaux. And um, and the idea there is, you know, you ask, you look at medical problems, you apply philosophical tools to solve them, often collaborating with um, health scientists or clinicians. You you publish in venues that are visible to medicine or, or medical science. Uh, and um, and hopefully you actually advance medical literature and um, contribute to solving medical, in this case, or scientific problems, and not just the philosophical literature and scientific uh, uh, the philosophical literature and philosophical problems. Um, but really, the, the the discipline that's achieved this um, best in in the area of medicine and medical philosophy is bioethics. Right. And so, you know, philosophy of medicine over the past couple of decades has kind of tried to define itself. Um, in contrast to bioethics, um, you know, we do, we, we, we deal with philosophical problems in medicine, but we don't do bioethics. It's kind of a partial mm. positive and partial negative characterization of the discipline itself. And this maybe was thought to be necessary because bioethics was so huge and the ethical problems of medicine received so much more attention that we didn't want um, these other problems that we were trying to explore to be swamped by that work. Right. So it was a very common way to uh, to characterize the discipline in writing and in, in conference calls for abstracts and so on. Um, now, philosophy of medicine and bioethics used to be, I, I'd say, closer together. Um, if you go back decades, um, where the main problem, main questions were about the nature of medicine, clinical judgment, whether medicine is a science and art or art, um, uh, the concepts of health and disease, and disability. Um, these are the, the the, pro- the problems, the questions that occupied a lot of so-called philosophers of medicine, and they happened to also be bioethicists. The, a lot of the early journals in philosophy of medicine were also journals in bioethics. And um, so really it was in the after the year 2000 that there was this kind of turn in philosophy of medicine to try to define itself as being something distinct um, in order to create room to think about new questions that were maybe more connected to philosophy of science than to ethics. And um, this might have had some some virtues, but I think it has resulted in philosophy of medicine being somewhat siloed from bioethics, ironically. Yeah. Um, siloed maybe from some of the ethical or political questions in um, that are relevant mm. to medicine, but also just siloed from this, this institution, bioethics, that's been very successful at having an impact on medical research and practice. Um, you know, if you want a model of, a, of an area where there's a lot of, where there is genuine philosophical work going on and they've actually had an influence on, um, on society and science. Bioethics is a great model of that. Um, so if we want as philosophers of medicine to have an impact on 
you know, society and science and medicine, then the bioethics offers us both a model, but also a door, um, an open yeah. door, perhaps. Um, and so reintegrating these two areas, philosophy that's of right. medicine and bioethics, I think is a growing interest of, of mine. Um, and so that's also partly the motivation for this is to is to try to draw some of these connections and build some of these bridges between philosophy of science and medicine on the one hand and uh, bioethics on the other hand. I appreciate that. No, that's really interesting to think about, especially just the the challenges of connecting. I've generally heard from, on the one hand, philosophers who are, have interest in philosophy of medicine. They feel like that from what they said, when, from what I hear them saying, they don't want to be pinned down to uh, just focus on particular questions in bioethics, or or often it comes down to like supervising or teaching in a particular aspect of bioethics. So if you're at a university and you're associating with or wanting to teach a course or do research in something, um, but you have these other issues or, or questions with um, you know medical epistemology or uh, in your case uh, you know evidence based medicine, um, and it, it's not quite a bioethics bend. So that's really interesting to hear about the connection. Is there? So is there something like, let's say at the, um, uh, one of the, the big bioethics conference, the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, is there a presence of philosophers of medicine who still attend that conference or is that, you know, are they separate, uh, in, in, in that regard? Yeah. So I think the answer is yes. Um, there is a philosophy of medicine, uh, uh I'm not sure if it's called a section or an interest group, um, within, um, the American Society for Bioethics. Um, and so the, at the conference, um, they'll often have a session, um, and I presented at this. Um, and of course there are, but probably more than that, there are philosophers of medicine at bioethics conferences who are there not really as philosophers of medicine per se, but as bioethicists, because they also do research in bioethics. Um, or at least that's the way you might describe the situation if you buy into this sharp distinction between philosophy of medicine and bioethics. Um, you see what I'm saying? So they might right. be there, right. but they're okay. presenting bioethics work. And if you, right. if you right. think that but philosophy of medicine is not bioethics, then they're, they're philosophy, they might do philosophy of medicine in their other work, but they're there presenting bioethics work. So uh, there is some presence, I think, but it's not massive um, from my own experience, my understanding. Um, and um, and so this is a question for the field, I think, going forward, is what should be the relationship between philosophy of medicine and bioethics? And then, you know, bioethics, of course, has its own unique features. It's not just philosophical ethics applied to medicine is it um clinicians are involved uh, legal scholars are involved in the discipline empirical scientists are involved it's an interdisciplinary field um and so um that's one way of maybe potentially as philosophers of science having an influence is through uh, interdisciplinary work or collaborating with other kinds of scholars um but I think as I kind of explore the relationship between these two areas, philosophy of medicine and bioethics, are there lessons to be learned more broadly in philosophy of science about yeah. how it is that certain disciplines have been successful at having what I think is a positive impact on um, science and practice? What are some of the challenges that uh, confront us there? And maybe even the more metaphilosophical and fundamental question that we should be asking first is, what is the point of philosophy of science? Should yeah. it concern itself with uh, actual science and practice? Is it excusable to not do that? Uh, what is its role and relevance? And um, you know, what, uh, will it continue to survive in a in a increasing in a what seems to be an increasingly STEM focused uh, academic environment? If it's not seen, if it's not felt to be relevant to um, to the world around it, now I do think actually that philosophy of science is very relevant to the world, and there's lots of philosophers of science who are demonstrating that. Um, so this is really more about uh, what are the different models for doing that or the ways of thinking about doing that institutionally, you know, intellectually, what are the different ways of, of, of achieving this? And, um, and so, you know, maybe bioethics is one, one kind of exemplar um, for how to go about thinking about it. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I hadn't made the connection. I mean, I just have known that bioethics is always this connection, but as thinking about it as a as a model or vehicle for um especially if you're doing kind of work that you hope to have an impact in the particular science or in the particular field in which you're doing the philosophy um it's really good i just yeah i can't think of another branch of philosophy of, well I, there might be but well such a large something like bioethics where you see such a large collection of both scientists and philosophers getting together um and the yeah. journals themselves 
the, the, the scientists and the, the clinicians or practitioners or the researchers really taking an interest and because they have the interest in, in these questions uh, for certain, maybe not to the same degree, but um, they just there isn't, a, you know, just just institutionally, organizationally, there's not something that is um, it's it's generally like niche uh, niche practitioners that kind of come out to kind of join in. So, yeah, I could definitely see something where people I don't know how. I guess I'll have to look into the history of bioethics as a discipline, as a field, and see like how how this branch ended up breaking off and from medicine proper, or or maybe not. Maybe that's probably the wrong way to think about it. But I, I don't know. I'm just kind of assuming like how did it uh, come to be? Perhaps you know a little bit about that. But um, yeah. So anyway, and th- so um, this might you might be just be uh, reiterating because this kind of got into some problems related to philosophy of science but so feel free to just say uh just what i was talking about but what do you take to uh, as a last question what do you take to be the greatest challenge facing philosophy of science today well i actually was going to say that it's this this perhaps this very problem is um trying to understand the point of the discipline and its relevance to um to society and the broader world um, um you know, there are constant anxieties around um, about the sustainability of the field, about job security and, and these kinds of elements. Um, there, you might have worries about, um, you know, there might be um, side effects. Um, we might have genuine concerns. If we, if philosophy of science becomes more integrated with um, science, um, it's, you know, we might lose the kind of independence um, that we have if we're in our own departments um the independence of thought uh, the, the independence of being able to say what we want to criticize science um from a distance um, without mm-hmm. you know having to live with those same colleagues in a, the same department and maybe even um risk um uh, you know offending the wrong people the wrong bosses um so there might be some intellectual and institutional reasons why some separateness is actually quite beneficial we might uh, you know, if you're too close to a discipline, maybe you start to, maybe the assumptions of that discipline become invisible to you. Um, and maybe you start to think too much like the people in that discipline. Um, so actually maybe the, maybe a kind of separateness is also valuable. So having said that, I think, you know, we need to ask ourselves, how can philosophy of science in a sense stay in touch with, uh, science and society? I mean, we, we should also consider the possibility that there are some virtues, um, yeah. of, a, of a kind of detachment. Um, and so, and so that's why I think that we, we just have to think in terms of different models for doing this. Um, there might not be just one model, um, that we should use. Maybe we need lots of different models that collectively, epistemically, it will be the best way to, um, to make progress in philosophy and in science. Thank you. And that's something, so a lot of folks have talked about models for integration or models for connecting, but I would love to see a model, um, a clearer model of detachment. Not that necessarily I'm advocating for one, but just one that kicks in mind the idea that former, the former model of detachment or, you know, the way in which things were done, people were unsat- dissatisfied with or perhaps, um, or the, the reason there as, as for the reasons that other folks have wanted to be more engaged or that we see this in practice, these in practice approaches. But is there something to be said for like a new model of uh, detachment or a new model of, um, separation, uh, siloing that we don't just see si- like we talk about, so- disciplinary silos is a bad thing sometimes and i think it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. have to be just for the reasons that you suggested so uh, right. that'll be that'll be just to think so anyway we've gone we've gone way too long <laughs> i mean a lot just long i've really enjoyed our, our talk thank you uh, uh dr fuller That's john right. for for uh for joining us and sharing about your book we're very excited uh to see its release uh, pending and um but anyway yeah have a good rest of your uh wednesday here in pittsburgh and uh yeah i'll be talking and see you soon Thank you, Nick. All right. Take care. Have a good one.